I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. By the time Richard Nixon reached the White House in 1969, the Cold War had been underway for more than two decades. The superpowers had reached a crossroads. They could continue the saber rattling and confrontations that threatened to plunge the world into nuclear war. Or they could agree to disagree and seek areas of mutual interest. In 1969, they chose the latter and a decade of relative calm in the Cold War began. In Europe, West German Chancellor Willy Brandt called it Ostpolitik. In the United States, Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, called it detente. It did not end the Cold War, but it created a framework for cooperation among the rivals. 1972, President Nixon embarked on a diplomatic trip that came to symbolize detente. When he touched down at Capitol Airport near Peking, Nixon became the first American president to be welcomed in the Communist People's Republic of China. It was a historic opening in the Cold War. During a week of diplomacy and cultural exchange, two former enemies made great progress toward normalizing relations. Not to be outdone, Soviet Union reached out to the West as well. German Leonid Brezhnev saw detente as an opportunity to gain access to valuable foreign aid and open its borders to international trade. In May 1972, the Kremlin in Moscow played host to the American president. Together, Nixon and Brezhnev signed the first ever agreements to limit nuclear weapons. The SALT I and ABM treaties were largely symbolic, but they represented a mutual effort to work towards cooperation and coexistence. <laughs> President Nixon appealed to the Soviet people and their leaders. Dobrovetsky, as we look at the prospects for peace, we see that we have made significant progress at reducing the possible sources of direct conflict between us. But history tells us that great nations have often been dragged into war without intending it by conflicts between smaller nations. As great powers, we can and should use our influence to prevent this from happening. Our goal should be to discourage aggression in other parts of the world and particularly among those smaller nations that look to us for leadership and example. With great power goes great responsibility. Nixon's peace offensive was soon overshadowed by the intrigue and cover-ups of the Watergate scandal. Some of these events in 1969 and 1970 included intensive harassment of political candidates. Congressional hearings revealed that the president and his staff had waged an illegal war against their political opponents, members of the media, leaders of the anti-war movement. Crimes had been committed. Congress threatened impeachment. For Nixon, it was the end of the line. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Detente continued under President Gerald Ford, notably with the signing of the 1975 Helsinki Final Act. In Helsinki, Finland, President Ford, Chairman Brezhnev, and 33 other world leaders formally acknowledged the post-World War II borders in Europe and recognized the universal significance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Chairman Brezhnev was nervous about the human rights provision, but his foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, reassured him that it was just a piece of paper. President Ford said the issue was a time bomb for the Soviets, for it established an internationally accepted standard 
by which communist governments could be held accountable for the treatment of its citizens. Emboldened by this legal and moral authority, thousands of freedom-loving individuals challenged the governments that enslaved them. Helsinki watch groups monitored human rights abuses behind the Iron Curtain and brought them to world attention. Many activists were targeted by official government harassment. In 1977, the Soviet Union's secret police service, the KGB, reported that it had investigated members of the Moscow Helsinki Watch and uncovered slanderous materials and hostile documents that could inflict serious political damage on the Soviet state. The report was signed by KGB chief Yuri Andropov. The campaigns were not limited to the Soviet Union. In communist Czechoslovakia, a small group of dissidents drafted a human rights manifesto called the Charter 77 Declaration. It petitioned the Czech government to live up to the promises it had made at Helsinki. The government denounced the signatories and retaliated. Playwright Václav Havel was among the many Chartists who were arrested and imprisoned for subversion and hostility towards the socialist state. In 1979, the wave of defiance crested. The leader of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope John Paul II, brought a message of hope to his native Poland. He reassured the millions of Poles who greeted him, be not afraid. You must be strong with the strength of hope. The Pope became a powerful force for change in communist Poland. He became a chief supporter of Solidarność, or Solidarity, an independent trade union led by Lech Walesa, the first ever to be established in a communist bloc country. In the United States, a new president, Jimmy Carter, made human rights the centerpiece of his new administration. The passion for freedom is on the rise. Tapping this new spirit, there can be no nobler, nor more ambitious path for America to undertake on this day of a new beginning than to help shape a just and peaceful world that is truly humane. President Carter spent three years working in vain to further the cause of world peace and to bring an end to the Cold War. By the end of his term, the Soviet Union's arsenal equaled that of the US. And America's world supremacy was being openly challenged. In 1979, America's old ally in the Middle East, the Shah of Iran, was forced from power during the Iranian Revolution. Nine months later, student followers of the Shiite cleric Ayatollah Khomeini stormed the American embassy. Scores of Americans were taken captive and held for more than a year. The hostage crisis, coupled with the shifting balance in the Cold War, convinced many Americans that their nation had lost its international power and prestige. Then on Christmas Day 1979, the Soviets struck a fatal blow to detente when they invaded Afghanistan to prop up a feeling Marxist dictatorship. Detente had taken the chill off of the Cold War, but it had never been a solution to the deep-seated hostilities that caused it. By 1980, the temperature was falling and sabers were unsheathed. New actors waited in the wings as the stage was set for the final decisive battle of the Cold War.